Today we're talking about shoulder impingement. We're talking about the pain you get when you try to lift your arm up high or out to the side. We're gonna talk about shoulder impingement syndrome and its related surgery, which is called subacromial decompression or acromioplasty. And we're gonna talk about the evidence for and against that surgery. So if you're ready, let's get ready to think right, move right, and feel right. Before we get started, I want to make sure you understand my own personal history with shoulder problems. This shoulder used to go clunk and get out of place every couple months anytime I did anything overhead. For a very long time, I couldn't even lift my arm out to the side without having to like uh, gingerly snap through something. And then once it clunked, it would allow me to go a little bit further, but it still never felt really good. I tried physical therapy and I considered surgery many, many times, but I watched somebody else go through surgery multiple times to repair his rotator cuff tears, and I did not want any part of what was going on with him. So today we're going to be talking about shoulder impingement. We're going to look at some of the history of this diagnosis, and we're going to talk about where we're at now. The big question you may be wondering is, do you need to get surgery to fix shoulder impingement? If you lift your arm up and it just feels stuck, does it mean that you absolutely 100% have to get surgery to fix it? Well, let's talk about it. So first, a quick overview of shoulder impingement. I'm reading from an article that you can find on my website at uprighthealth.com, and I will link to it in the description box so you can find it directly. It is an article specifically about shoulder impingement. So surgeons often claim that shoulder impingement syndrome, also known as subacromial impingement, is the result of bad bone shapes. The theory was first introduced in 1972. So the general idea is that the shape of your acromion process, which is this little pointy nub up here, if it's shaped wrong, then it's going to result in rotator cuff tears, okay? So the idea was introduced by a surgeon, Charles S. Near II, and he had dissected cadavers for evidence of rotator cuff tears and proposed that there was correlation with the chromium shape. So the theory is that there are three types of chromium shapes, and type one, type two, and type three are the ones we're paying attention to. Type one is considered normal in this whole theory. Type two and three are considered to be at higher risk for subacromial impingement, meaning that if your acromion is allegedly shaped wrong, then it is going to result in tearing of your rotator cuff tendons as you lift your arm up, okay? So that was the theory for decades. And so if this theory is actually true, we should expect to see that type two and type three are strongly correlated with shoulder impingement. And we should also see that surgery to reshape the bone there should actually be really great. It should help solve all these problems. But in reality, we don't observe either of those two phenomenons. So we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into this. Okay, first, so let's look at acromion types and rotator cuff damage. A 2002 study searched for an association between the acromion type and rotator cuff pathology. They did this on patients who are over 50 years old and they saw there was no link between the shape of your acromion and having rotator cuff tears. Okay, so what about these allegedly, these, these bad acromion types that are allegedly two and three, and they, they must be the cause of your rotator cuff tears. Well, in the 2010 study, researchers looked at 305 people, 21 years and older, who were asymptomatic and with no history of shoulder problems. They found that in the asymptomatic population, 81.3% had type two acromions and 14.1% had type three acromions. So just to review, type two and type three are the ones that are supposed to be strongly correlated with rotator cuff tears. If Charles Near was correct. But what they found was in fact, the vast overwhelming majority of people have type two and type three acromions, which means only 4.6% had the allegedly normal type one acromion in an asymptomatic population. Okay, so if type one is normal, why is type two and type three the overwhelming majority and how come all these people don't have symptoms? All right, well, that kind of makes this whole theory a little bit shaky. So finally, in a 2018 study, researchers found no correlation between acromion shape and rotator cuff tears in 227 subjects. So again, if acromion shape is a major cause of impingement pain and rotator cuff tears, none of this would make sense. We wouldn't see these results, okay? so. 
So in the 2018 study, the authors noted the shortcomings of this bad acromion type theory. There were two, there's another doctor involved, Bigliani, and so uh, in this they say, quote, Near and Bigliani reported that the type three acromion type is closely related to rotator cuff tears. However, both studies were based on only small cases of cadavers, not live human beings. And in their conclusion, they say, we have proved that age is the most powerful predicting factor, whereas a chromium type had no significant relationship with supraspinatus tear and multiple rotator cuff tears. Okay, and so it's also important to note that there was an article in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery that um, kind of did a, a retrospective of Nier's um, original paper on uh, shoulder impingement theory. And uh, quoting from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, they say, Nier believed that Im impingement causes rotator cuff tears. This hypothesis does not appear to have withstood the test of time. It is more likely that rotator cuff dysfunction results in upward displacement of the humeral head and causes impingement of the humeral head against the acromion with shoulder use rather than the reverse. So to translate that into English, they're saying the muscles, the rotator cuff muscles, if they don't work right, they lead to premature contact of the humerus with the acromion. Not that the bones are the cause of the premature contact, but rather the things that move the bones are the things that are causing the contact. In other words, the bone shape doesn't seem to be relevant. It has not withstood the test of time, which they say. The theory that the bone shapes were causing the actual premature contact is being poo-pooed by the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. They're very clearly saying the muscles were the thing, the muscle function, those rotator cuff muscles are the thing to pay attention to. Of course, they go on and suggest that you should get surgeries to fix those dysfunctions, which is a whole other can of worms. But the main point here is that the bone theory doesn't apply. So now we need to look at whether or not shoulder impingement surgery actually works because it was being done for decades to fix people's shoulder pain without adequate scientific investigation. You should know that this is actually not uncommon in orthopedic surgery. Many orthopedic surgeries have not undergone rigorous testing. And so, for example, knee meniscus surgery, when it was put up against a placebo-controlled fake surgery, when it was put in a trial where it had to compete against a surgery that looked like it was the real thing but wasn't actually, the two were basically the same. Okay, the real surgery turned out to be only as effective, actually a little bit less effective maybe, than the placebo surgery. And real surgery has real risks. So there were benefits of zero over a fake surgery, all right? That was also true in a trial that was done for knee surgery to treat knee osteoarthritis. It's been shown also that arthroscopic surgery to go clean out the gunk in your knee it's no better than fake surgery. This is not something that's rare, okay? So a 2017 study published in The Lancet showed there was barely any difference in outcome between shoulder impingement patients who had surgery, fake surgery, or no treatment at all. They found patients who received no treatment at all scored only slightly worse than patients who had placebo or real surgery, which means there's like no difference between not doing anything, getting a fake surgery, and getting a real surgery. So when you do the actual trials and don't let the shoulder surgeons determine how you interpret the results and how you ask the questions about the trial, then guess what? All that amazing, all those marketing claims that the surgery is gonna fix all your problems, those all disappear in the face of actual evidence. So the researchers state the difference between the surgical groups and no treatment might be the result of, for instance, a placebo effect or post-operative physiotherapy. The findings question the value of this operation for these indications, and this should be communicated to patients during the shared treatment decision-making process. Uh, in other words, you should really rethink doing the surgery and let patients know that even though the medical system spent decades telling everybody that you should get shoulder impingement surgery to fix your shoulder impingement. Oops, it actually doesn't work based on the science, but don't worry, you'll still be able to find plenty of surgeons who disregard this evidence and tell you you still need shoulder impingement surgery. Closing thoughts, how can you fix your shoulder impingement without surgery? You need to focus on your muscles. That's why I always say ATM, always think muscles. Just like the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery said, rotator cuff dysfunction, muscle dysfunction, 
is what causes bones to move in ways that you don't like. And now they would say you need to go and diagnose tears in your rotator cuff and then fix those and that would supposedly fix things. But if we're gonna take a less invasive approach, we're gonna think about how to retrain muscle function, okay? And train those muscles to move the bones correctly so that we have less discomfort, so that we have full function. There are a lot of muscles around the shoulder that restrict range, that can restrict range of motion if they're trained to be shortened all the time. There are muscles that, if too weak, will not allow you to get a full range of motion. So you need to train the entire range of motion in your shoulder so that everything feels better. You wanna make sure you have strength at every length. And above all, you want to remember, don't get caught in rips, rest, ice, injections, pills, and surgery. As you can see from the history of shoulder impingement, even if doctors are extremely confident about how effective their treatments are, the science can be completely in the opposite direction. Doctors can be very confident because they haven't scientifically investigated the effectiveness of their treatments, and even if they're communicating that confidence to you, doesn't necessarily mean that that treatment is actually effective. And in the orthopedic world, there are many treatments that have not undergone any sort of rigorous scientific testing. That said, they have real downside risks that are acknowledged and observed on a regular basis. Nobody just randomly dies from infection from doing exercise, but people who get surgeries unfortunately do have the risk of getting infections. It is rare, but it's far higher than the risk of infection from trying to exercise your shoulder properly. I made a video that shows you five exercises to help you fix your shoulder impingement. I'm gonna to link to it up here and at the end of this video and in the description box. Go watch that video. If you're looking for a full program to help you reprogram your shoulder function and your upper body posture, go to uprighthealth.com slash DIY and check out the Shoulder Fix program. But first, please make sure you watch my totally free video on those five exercises to help you fix your shoulder impingement. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section down below for that free video to help you with shoulder impingement. Check it out right here. And if you wanna support this channel by becoming a patron or sending a PayPal donation, use the donate link you'll find in the description box or use the join and thanks buttons on YouTube. Like, share, and subscribe with the bell notification on. And as always, I hope you remember that pain sucks. Life shouldn't be.